Hi, and welcome to another Razorback screencast. So in our last screencast, we sort of finished up the uh, UV mapping of this arm. And we can see all these colored patterns all over the objects. I was specific there in saying objects, because they're all separate objects. Um, and this actually makes me think of uh, something that I think we should pause for. And that's sort of a strategic decision of how many texture maps do we have. So if we take a look at the armor, for instance, we had one texture map for all of the armor, I believe. If we go to our UV view, we can see that both sides of the armor are on one texture map. Uh, we could load the texture, I believe, and we would be able to see the actual uh, color map. So this right here represents one side and this represents the other, the scratches that is. And if we go back to the view, we can sort of see that the texture wraps seamlessly from one side to the other. Now that's interesting because we have one texture file that we need to maintain. If we change the colors or the shading in one file, it affects both sides of the machine, and in this case, that's a really good thing. I've been thinking about this scenario with the arm and how many objects we have. I mean, just counting, we have one, two, three, four, five. So five separate objects. One option is to use one texture map for each object. Now, that sounds okay. We have five textures for five objects. That makes sense. What about when we mirror the arm? Well, we're not going to want symmetrical textures. We probably want textures for the right side and textures for the left side. So that's starting to sound like 10 texture maps instead of just five. Well, what if we wanted color and reflection channels because we wanted to put some scratches on the arms, similar to how we put scratches on the armor? Well, all of a sudden, you're looking at 20 texture maps. If I did my math correctly there. So the idea is that we want to minimize the amount of textures we're using, if anything, just to make sure that our workflow is concise. So what I'm going to do is start off by taking the right arm end null, and I'm just going to hide it. What we're left with is the objects that we mapped. So let's just step through this one more time conceptually. So if we were to select, I'm just going to move this to a side-by-side -side view. If we were to select this object, we see we have a few islands or shells. If we select the other object, we have a few. We select the third, so on and so forth. Each of them sort of takes up a roughly square space. So there's a couple different ways we can do this. We can actually say, okay, we have five objects. What if we were to make a really big texture map and just put one square of polygons on each section of the map? Well, that'll work okay. Considering we have five, it means we will have a blank space left over. Plus, I'm not sure if this is a limitation of Cinema 4D or not, but I've not figured out how to get around this. If I were to select more than one polygonal object, it still only shows me the most recently selected one in the view here. So that kind of means that I can't look at all of these objects at the same time on one UV map. And that's what I'd really like to do. For a model like this, I think the ideal scenario is to put all of these polygons from all five objects on one texture map. Sort of scale them and move them around until they're optimally sized. And then we can paint them all at once. Now, in order to do that, we're going to need to join them all into one polygonal mesh. So let's start by doing that. Now, before we do that, some of you guys might be thinking, but wait, we're going to lose the pivot points. Well, we're not, because back when we started these arms, I made certain that each pivot was actually a null object. You can see here that I'm clicking through all the pivot points in the hierarchy. What this means is that we can substitute these polygonal objects 
as we like. We can replace them with higher resolution versions, we can replace them with lower resolution versions, or we can join them all together, split them all apart, and then put them back where they belong. So this is not going to be an issue for us. So let's start by just selecting all of them and connecting them, and then seeing what that does for us. So I'll start with the right pivot, and control clicking to select all of the other parts. Now this part here presents a challenge. We hid this object, but beneath here we still have some hierarchy. The shaft, the blade instance, the pin, and the other pin are all children of the right plate. Now as long as they are children of the right plate, we cannot connect the right plate to the rest of them. So we have to remember to leave this out. If we wanted to connect them though, we just needed to ungroup it. But I just realized the right plate is not UV mapped, so we want to exclude that anyway. So let's just select these five objects. And what we can do is we can just sort of say connect objects plus delete. So what that's done is it's deleted all these objects, but it's left us with one polygonal mesh. While we're in this state of sort of UV mapping bliss, we have to remember not to move this hierarchy at all. Because if we do, we'll lose our, our, our spot, we'll lose our place. We won't be able to put things back to where they were. So it's really important that we keep things how they are. Now that these are all one object, it's actually really easy to separate the UV meshes. Now when I say separate, we mapped all five of these objects in their own independent UV space. So what that means is that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move this object out of the hierarchy and hide everything else for clarity. What that means is that each one of these objects, now I can't even remember which ones the objects were. There was this one, this one. Notice I'm using the polygonal tools this time to select sort of these contiguous meshes. These guys were on one object. This was another object. And then down here was the final one. So we can easily select these using the fill polygon selection tool. It sort of just selects connected polygons. And then if we go to the texture view, we can see everything's all overlapping. That's because we mapped everything in the same space. And that's normal. It's usually what we do. Now the quick and dirty way of doing this task is to go to the texture view with either nothing or everything selected and go to optimal mapping, realign, probably want to preserve orientation, equalize island size, and just say apply. So what it's going to do is it's going to spread all of the parts out evenly on this one mesh. Now that that works, kind of, um, but all of our parts are mixed up now. We don't really know which parts belong to what. For instance, right here is part of the lower arm. Well, over here is another part of it, the base that is. And I think this is the other part of it. So as you can see, everything's sort of spread out and it's not well connected. So that's the reason that I would typically take a different approach. And here's what I normally do. We select a continuous group of mesh, so like this lower part here with the motor sticking out, sort of a District 9 inspired look. And I'm just going to move it over here to outside of the UV space. I'll just leave it there for now. Then I move on to another group. So let's do the polygons that are representing the base plate. And we just move it again, sort of imagining that there's a virtual grid and we're moving it into the grid space. And just sort of continue. So let's see, let's do this upper arm part. It's technically the lower arm. And then let's go with the sibling object right here. I'm just sort of spreading it out as if there were a virtual grid. And that leaves us with this last bit right here, 
which is already uncovered. Now, we have too many objects to fit into the space, and we don't necessarily want to surrender and say, okay, Cinema 40, just, just realign everything for us. We'll just take what you give us. So the first thing I like to do is sort of scale everything down a little bit. And I handle this iteratively. Um, so I'm going to scale everything down just a bit. And now we get to see if we can make things fit a little bit better. So in this case, I have my virtual grid space number one, my virtual grid space number two. And we have three, four, five. So what I can do is just give some of these objects a little bit of breathing room. Some breathing room is good when texturing. We can also see that some of these objects down here might benefit from being shifted over just a little bit. And so these are all still a group, but they're not necessarily fitting within a square anymore, and that's okay. So we can sort of move this here, and you see conveniently certain parts fit into other parts, and that's useful. I didn't plan that, I just saw the opportunity. Likewise, we can say, well, maybe if we rotate this part a little bit, we can sort of take advantage of the space that it occupies a little bit more. Similarly, before, this was exactly a square, so we had to constrain all the objects. Well, this cylinder here, the circle, is part of this object, but it doesn't have to live on the outskirts anymore. We can put it here, between these two objects. It's not really splitting it up if it's still in the same general vicinity. So we can then take all of these objects here and start to move them down and see if there's anywhere they can fit. And here is where we kind of see the limitations of what we're doing. We see we're packing the objects in a lot better than Cinema 4D was doing on its own. And of course, it's no fault of its own. It's just a machine following an algorithm. But at the same time, we have some spots where I feel like there's some optimizations we can make. There's one. Here's another. And we're sort of we're sort of getting to the limits where we we can't really fit these parts in any better. So what I'll do is I'll select all the parts again and we'll scale them down a little bit more. Just a little bit like that. Now we can sort of say, all right, what other parts can we sacrifice here to shuffle around to make some more room? So if we move this plate up and rotated it, sure, we're sort of moving it out of its original context, but not too far, and that's okay. Similarly, if we were to take this band of polygons right here and move it over to the edge where we have a tall section to spare, we may be able to take these parts and sort of move them over a little bit more. Again, not really changing the relationship to each other, but definitely changing their relationship to their surroundings. And of course, the goal is to get everyone to fit in this space. We want all the parts to be able to fit. And so we can sort of see the limitations we're working within. It would be great if we can get this part here to fit down there, and it almost fits. It seems like it would fit if these weren't here, so let's just move those. I'm sure we can find a space for those to fit. Now I know this is going against what I said a little bit earlier, where we don't want to spread the parts out from each other. But in this case, we're spreading them out in sort of a calculated way. We're not just randomly placing shells or islands far away from each other. We're strategically placing them away from each other. And I think that's a much better situation to find yourself in. So right here, it looks like we have all of these objects on this shell, maybe not optimized in a computational fashion like Cinema 40 would have done for us. But for the most part, they're in the general vicinity they belong in. Let's, let's test that. So what we can do is we can use the fill selection tool. We can select these. 
and then we can go back to our polygonal view go back to the UV view and we can see as we select different groups of polygons they're still roughly grouped in the same vicinity this guy's a little spread out but that's only because he had to make room for this bracket down here which is still kind of grouped so if one of our objects gets spread out just so the rest of them can be close together I think from an organizational concept that works really well so what we have now is all of these objects sharing one texture map not one material but one actual map because we have one UV tag one material tag and then we have a bunch of selection tags here we don't actually need those now we have this arm and we need to separate the objects again to put them back in hierarchy so there's a really cool tool that does just that under mesh conversion you can say polygon groups to objects each one of those contiguous groups I was selecting with the fill selection tool is going to be converted into an object now some of these are going to be broken apart too much but we can always join those so there's the base plate there's the upper arm there's the other part of the upper arm this is the cap the other cap the main arm and then the base so with these three objects here the cap and the main arm what we can basically do is say connect objects plus delete so this actually brings us down to six objects because these two guys here are separate in our original strategy they weren't so we can select those and we say connect objects plus delete so now we're back down to our original five objects with a little bit of renaming and placing them back into the hierarchy we should be back where we were at the beginning of the screencast so let's try that we have this pivot here and let's call that base bracket then we have this object here this is lower uh, and then we had that as like right forearm so let's just call that forearm this one is upper arm this one is large arm I'm just going off of the names in the actual hierarchy below and this one here is arm base so arm base and base bracket go in the let's see base bracket goes in the right pivot arm base can go in that null I have a separate null for it in case we wanted to do any yaw like that and then we have large arm upper arm so that's probably small arm but we can let's rename it small arm and then we have forearm which is sort of the part at the end and what we've got here is we've got our same hierarchy that we started out with so we can use the pivot to bring the arm outboard so that's 90 degrees right there and we have the base null that we didn't really rotate before and then we have the right arm the upper sort of large arm and then we have the small part and then we have the forearm that can twist and then on the end of that we have the null that we can also twist on the red axis there the X and we have all of these objects back in their hierarchy now there's a step that we sort of glazed over I'm just going to fold the arm back up and the step was when we split the object into a bunch of different pieces and we went up to the mesh menu and we said polygon groups to objects let's take a look at the texture view again and see what we did what we'll end up having is one large texture that houses the UV map and the texture data for all of these objects but each 
object only occupies a small space. This means we can paint from one object to the other in a single brush stroke, I believe. And it also means that if we were to edit this file in an external program like Adobe Photoshop or something else similar, we can actually do operations that are going to influence all five of the parts of the arm instead of just one part and then having to repeat the operation again. I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, but this is just one of the methods that's worked for me in the past. I have done entire motorcycle models using just one file for the entire texture. In some cases, it was pretty cumbersome. In other cases, it was such a time saver. It is so great to be able to open one file and then change the color of the wheels, the fairing, the fuel tank, the seat, the metal bits on the bike. Just change all the colors. And then all of a sudden you have a completely different looking bike just because you swapped out one file. So what we'd probably want to do is either paint these in Cinema 4D so it can figure out the coordinates or go to each object and write a UV mesh layer for that object so you can keep track of what's what when you're in a separate program. But I think I accomplished what we set out to do in this tutorial. We didn't really make a huge leap but we did reorganize this arm into something that might be a bit more manageable for us in the future. So I hope you enjoyed this one. And until next time, see ya.